Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Donoghue. Join us for our new podcast series, FX Omics. We'll be exploring the new technologies of integrative medicine, including genomics, metabolomics, the microbiome, and many more fields that are transforming healthcare. We're focusing on how they apply to practitioners and how we can incorporate them into our patient care. We aim to make these exciting and sometimes challenging fields relevant to you and your practice. Search for FX Omics on your favourite podcast platform and we look forward to your company. Today we're going to cover something which is dear to my heart with Lara. She's with us to do a kind of preamble to her presentations on the 14th of June. But the things we're going to cover today are one of my favorite and least acknowledged hormones, but one that's her specialty, it's progesterone, which um, I laughed my little Siri machine called it progesterone all the way through the things that I listened to about it. So it's so unknown that its name is not even well known. I want to welcome you, Lara. Um, it's good to talk about the forgotten the forgotten hormone. We all know estrogen, we all know testosterone, and we keep on forgetting about the most important. It one, is. It? It's like the ugly stepsister of hormones. <laughs> or maybe like the Cinderella of hormones. It gets left behind when everybody else goes to the party. And yet it does all the good stuff. It does all the good stuff. And, uh, and I think that we get so much uh, the kind of common knowledge. Everybody knows estrogen and good skin and fertility. And the feeling is that there's estrogen and testosterone and they're both anabolic hormones. They're both, they're both in a similar line. But the, the catabolics, the, the C19s, are a very important hormone. And the progesterone has gaining a very, very good reputation for a whole lot of things beside purely Absolutely. fertility. Absolutely, yeah. But let's, yeah. Start, yeah, let's start with that. Let's just go to what is progesterone? And I know it comes from cholesterol. It's a sterol hormone. It's on the wrong side of the tracks of catabolic anabolic hormones. What does it do? Why why is it such a high concentration? Why do we, why do women especially produce so much? And it's a lot, isn't it, Mark? As you know, it's about it's a hundred times it more than estrogen. So it's a difference of actually yes. two decimal points in terms of the amount that we produce. If you look at the units, picomoles versus nanomoles. So yes. it's kind of crazy when you think about it that way. The other thing that's special about progesterone is that we make it only for those sweet two weeks of our cycle. I call it the lifespan <laughs> of a butterfly. We, we make that corpus luteum and we get it for only a short time and then it's gone. Except for pregnancy, of course, when we make astronomical amounts of progesterone, which is also yeah. an important... Yeah. That's the job of the uh, that's the job yeah. of the placenta, though, isn't it? I mean, corpus luteum to placenta, so it's in a baby's interest and a mum's interest right the way through yep. pregnancy. But it is only there that two weeks. It comes and goes, but it's not just a two-week hormone. It, it it's responsible for a lot of things in the it background. It is the way I like to think about it with ovarian hormones is, you know, clearly they're for making a baby. I think we spoke about this in our podcast about ovulation a few months, a couple months back. Right. But with human physiology, of course, everything is calibrated to the presence of those hormones. Just as in men, you know, testosterone is to help with male secondary characteristics and help with sperm production. But that's, but once you have, that's the kind of physiology you have. Everything depends on that, you know, bone density, muscle mass. Right. And the same goes for ovarian hormones. So our body definitely expects to have them. We, we function with, with them in mind. And that's whether we make them monthly as an ovulatory menstrual cycle or in a huge dose with pregnancy. This can, we have two options of women of which way we're going to make them. And progesterone is a lot about, when I think about progesterone, I think of, of its effect on the immune system. It's immune modulating, which makes sense given its role in pregnancy. It's so it's anti-inflammatory and it has a very profound effect on the nervous system as well, which I, I think we're going to have to cover today, particularly on the brain. It converts to a neurosteroid called allopregnolone, which has a profound effect on the brain is usually calming. Hmm. 
And that allopregnenolone, I, I am fascinated about it, but I've, I've got to yeah. just tell you the story. About five years back, a little story appeared that in rats, allopregnenolone could be increased um, artificially by giving a tiny dose of Bo Prozac, right. a two milligram of uh, Prozac, which is fluoxetine. And uh, it was then transferred to a little trial on humans with decreasing premenstrual syndrome. And every doctor that I know went while prescribing two milligram Prozac for every woman, because every doctor would just believed that every woman just needed to kind of settle down. It was fascinating. It did work, but it was a drug being used to do the job that the body would more normally do. Because we're on the topic of mood straight away. So we have a little poll for the audience here. Let's bring that up. If that's okay, moderator. See what that looks like about progesterone and mood. Um, so you're going to you're going to ask them first and then tell them the answer. Oh <laughs> my goodness, the answers. It's are... <laughs> fun to see these come in. Um, yeah, this is good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That is. So. That's fascinating. Okay, so you've obviously talked to these people. Before. Well, let's talk about this because progesterone. I think you know a lot of our audience knows that it generally has a positive effect on mood. Would you agree, Mark, that in the kind of more mainstream narrative of progesterone, it's attributed to having yeah. a negative effect on mood? That PMS, premenstrual symptoms, for example, are blamed on progesterone, which is they are. Yep. Yeah. No, they are. The, the blame is the rapid change yep. of the progesterone. The, the you know progesterone starts low, deep goes to the end and then as it crashes, the, everything is blamed on the progesterone, the sudden loss, the sudden drop. The withdrawal. Right? So I think that's a bit closer to the truth. I mean, certainly I've heard you know, some people say, some doctors or journalists say that progesterone itself is negative for mood. And this is where I, I would say the correct answer to that poll is de depends. Yes. <laughs> I think it is a depends yeah. situation. I'd like to talk that through if that's okay. I just think this is actually important right. yeah, that's so great. the first thing to say is that progesterone is very different from progestin drugs this has to be stated right at the beginning of our presentation today because this is where a lot of the confusion comes from because i would argue that most contraceptive progestin drugs have a negative effect on mood, arguably. I think not not for every woman and not severely, but in general, that's what the research now shows that hormonal contraception can have a negative effect on mood. And I think a lot of that's attributed to the progestin part of it. So it's quite important that when we're talking about progesterone and mood, that we don't confuse or conflate those two things, how progestins are for mood versus how progesterone is for mood. Would you agree? with that yet yeah. so yeah. yep the the yeah. question that i would ask is why did we why did we never have progesterone in contraception so what was the value was it simply manufacturing issues was it something as simple as that that made progestogens the dominant uh, hormone provider why not bioidentical or as they love to yeah. call it body identical why well, in the, never a thing? the invention of hormonal birth control was the fact that progesterone was not absorbed orally. Of course, it is now, right. but that's with the invention of something called microno, micronized progesterone, oral micronized progesterone, which was only invented in the 80s, I, I believe, in France, and has, of course, now become, and we're going to talk about that today, using oral progesterone, body identical or bioidentical progesterone as an option for a lot of treatment options. It's, it's not used as contraception so i think the main issue from the beginning was that it wasn't right. absorbed orally and also you need a pretty massive dose of progesterone yeah. to yeah to, to shut pregnancy. down ovarian function well you need at least 200 milligrams which yeah, certainly no one prescribes it that way for that purpose so right. that's yeah that's a really good question and but just staying on the topic of mood for a minute it's it's quite mm -hmm. a fascinating story so i think part of it as you've just said progesterone is generally good for beneficial for mood calming for the nervous system and then many of us can experience some withdrawal from that at the end of the luteal phase and that can be cause a mild agitation or anxiety which would just be the final 
you know, three or four days of the menstrual cycle. So, and estrogen's dropping then too. So that's going to be a double whammy at that time. But there's also, as some of the list, the listeners, the viewers, I'm sure know, there's also something called premenstrual dysphoric disorder or PMDD, which is different. It is in these women, from what I can tell from the research, they're reacting negatively to progesterone itself, which is fascinating to me. And what, the science seems to show on this with with regard to this it's all to do with the GABA receptor in the brain so everyone knows GABA is our one of our main inhibitory calming neurotransmitters you know serotonin gets all the discussion but actually GABA is huge I think most of our neurotransmitters 90 percent of our neurotransmitters are GABA and glutamate that's the pair the stimulating and yeah. Yeah. One argues against the other. It's uh, the stimulus. Exactly. And GABA is actually is. made from glutamate, yeah. which makes it even more interesting. But the metabolite of progesterone called allopregnolone interacts quite strongly with the GABA receptor. And this is where it's all happening. And our because of that, we have a GABA receptor that is a, highly adaptable to levels of neurosteroids. So the GABA receptor is made of these five subunits. I think of it like a transformer action figure, just depending on where you are in the cycle, it rearranges itself mm -hmm. to cr create a different receptor essentially to not be overwhelmed by allopregnolone, the neurosteroid. And what the evidence seems to show is women who with PMDD have a, their GABA receptor is not doing that as well. It's not adapting. It's not resilient to the ups and downs of progesterone. And of course, there are treatments for that, I would argue, but that's 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 in a nutshell where all this confusion about progesterone for mood comes from. A, sometimes we're talking about progestins rather than progesterone. And B, there are small, about one in 20 women who react quite negatively to progesterone. Um, a, is that a genetic predisposition, that re negative reactivity? Are you born with that and that's just the kind of the way that you do GABA and, and alone? Well, there's a genetic predisposition for sure. And then, mm. no surprise to all of us natural medicine practitioners, it's affected by inflammation. Right. So the resilience oh, okay. of the ability of that GABA receptor to change is affected by inflammation and also affected by histamine, which is another big player potentially in premenstrual mood okay. symptoms. So that's why I believe clinically premenstrual mood symptoms and even PMDD can respond quite well to a, a general anti-inflammatory approach, particularly as a clinical pearl for everyone listening, particularly pulling out dairy, cow's dairy from the diet for some women can, okay. in my, that's just purely a clinical observation, but can really make a difference in terms of not reacting to the luteal phase in that way. Yeah. Okay. Now, pro progesterone in itself is anti-inflammatory. Is it, is it anti-neuroinflammatory or broadly? So I, I know that progesterone in huge doses is being used after head injuries rather than cortisone it's being used for head injuries, motor vehicle accidents, five gram, 10 gram doses of the, of the stuff. Yeah. It is it potentially one of those things that can stop the brain over glutamating itself to cause the ongoing damage. And so it has a rapid calming yeah. effect. So that in itself, the, the hormone in itself, is that self protecting In terms of the GABA receptor, I'm not entirely sure of that. But yes, you're right that um, progesterone, allopregnolone generally has an anti-inflammatory effect in the brain. It's interesting in those trials you're talking about, they were giving progesterone to both men and women. So, which is quite yes, interesting. In fact, most yeah. of the trials were done on men, which is actually a you know, common thing in clinical research, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, well, you've got to keep the old white men alive long enough yeah. to stuff everything up. I mean, otherwise we die young and, you know, you don't want that happening. I've had, I'm just having, I'm just, I'm practicing looking at the comments here. I've had a question. Is the GABA receptor change, lack of change? It's um, high histamine. Um, oh, I see. I'm just, we're just learning the system. I'm just looking at the little question. Yeah, so I, I say when histamine okay. is high, it, that impacts or has a, reduces the resilience or the adaptability of the GABA receptor. I have a reference for that in, in my blog post oh. about this. 
So I'm going to try clicking that. There we go. <laughs> um, good. Uh, yeah. And, oh, I, and someone's just commenting in the comments. So true. Isn't it infuriating when reading the literature and they use progesterone and progestins interchangeably? Have you seen that, Mark? Like even in scientific yeah. studies on premenstrual, yeah. on PMDD, half the time they're talking about not menstrual cycles, but pill bleeds or pill cycles, which is as a little yeah. te I know you make that as a little teaser to my symposium yeah. talk. You'll get to hear me be quite passionate about this topic. We need to reclaim the language around what is an ovulatory menstrual cycle and speak about it more precisely than just you know estrogen versus progestin. Um, okay, good. Yep. So with with the pill, you create an artificial bleed that has nothing to do with ovulation. Yep. It has nothing to do with hormones. It's just a way of reminding people of a, the appearance of a Yeah, cycle, this is a spot. Rather than it being useful for the person in any Absolutely. This is a spoiler for the symposium, but it's just one of, you know, I have, I'm speaking for, what is it, 75 plus 20 plus 30 minutes that day. So there'll be lots to cover. But I will say here that, yeah, exactly as you said, the, the pill bleed is just mimicking a menstrual cycle in a very completely unnecessary way. Like there is zero medical reason to bleed monthly on hormonal birth control. It's done that way. It was a marketing technique right. to say, you know, the pill Perfect. is regulating a cycle, I guess. But in reality, estradiol, our main estrogen and progesterone are flatlined on the pill. And you'd know that as a clinician, just as a, a test, you know, you would see if you went to measure with a serum level, estradiol and progesterone, while someone's on the pill, what would you see? But nothing, like low, essentially menopause. Yeah. yeah. You, see no, you, you see no progesterone and it depends a little bit on the, on the type of the pill. The estradiol is a crossover there, but we do see the flattened progesterone and no sign of it anyway through, anywhere Absolutely. through there. And we also see the cortisol rise, yes. which I, I think is fascinating, you know, that when you're on the pill, the cortisone goes up by about 30%, 35%. Is... And I've always wondered about whether that's an effect of the progestogens rather than progesterone, which does not do that. Same. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. <laughs> yeah, pro progestins, Nothing. well, hormonal birth control alters the HPA or the adrenal axis, and it changes the shape of the hypothalamus. Right. So there's... Yes, the shape. That's Literally, we're going to we're going to talk about that at the I, symposium. I, I have a reference for that. So, okay. no surprise, you get alterations in stress hormone levels. Like to me, that just seems obvious. And as to all the different mechanisms as to why that happens, I think we're still to understand that. You know, there's very little research into this. I've seen a few quotes in social media, like, you know, okay, I think it's time. It's time now to start studying the impact of contraceptive drugs on the brain. After 60 years of use, it's like, let's finally start looking at what that's doing. Um, right. Lots of good questions coming in. We won't, I won't, we'll cover them. You know, we'll, um, we'll just keep talking. I saw one about adenomyosis, which we will, I think we should talk about later. At one point before we finish, we talk about the effect okay. of progesterone on heavy periods, but yeah. You know what, you paying attention to the questions has just loaded the questions up. Well, okay, you can check out the questions. Those, I'll close that. I'll you're, you're that the, guys, you're the, you will, you will you're the, you're the, you will have nothing You're the interviewer. Oh, well. But the good thing that when I open the. So I'll keep an eye on those. I will keep on reflecting those questions. Perfect. You keep talking. Should we, about, uh, should we talk about, about testing progesterone? Yeah, we could. I mean, that's a, yeah. that's an obvious question. Different practitioners have different ways of doing it. So what's, what's reliable? What would you use and what would you recommend actually reflects uh, real progesterone production? What would you rely on for clinical decision? Temperatures. Can we, have, can we have the other poll, <laughs> moderator, please? <laughs> um, I mean, of course, there are lots of ways, which we're going to detail now. But, you know, Mark, a lot of my work in my book and my work with patients, too, and my blogging, it's a lot about you know, women's health for the people, like doing this in a way, you know, a do it yourself kind of wow. measure. And I just want to say that measuring your basal body temperature and tracking your luteal phase is a scientific way to measure progesterone. 
And in some ways it's more accurate because you get the whole luteal phase, not just a, a point in time. And the, the way it works is that progesterone raises body temperature by 0 0.3 degrees Celsius. And that temperature goes up a couple of days after ovulation and it stays high for that entire, anywhere between 11 to 16 at the very outside, but usually 14, usually fewer than 14 days. And that if you ask your patients to do that, and I'm gonna show, I'm gonna go into this in the symposium, I actually have a, an actual picture of what a temperature chart looks like for anyone who hasn't done it, just to get that okay. um, information. And you can start to see very clearly when there's a luteal phase, if there's not a luteal phase, if ovulation hasn't occurred, it's very obvious. And, and also the quality of the temperature rise, like is it sustained or is it like bouncing up and down or is it, you know, the duration of it? So uh, that's all very interesting information. And we're just, I assume, I assume everyone can see the results of the poll. Most people do. Yeah. So that's great. And for anyone who doesn't, you can, we'll look at that. Yeah, we'll look at that in the Simple. symposium or there's tons of resource, resources about that, how to do that. Yeah. And beyond that, we can certainly talk about some of the other methods of testing because the, the method I use is blood testing as a serum progesterone. Okay. And the trick with it is, this is really important, is the timing of it. Because I can't tell you, and you'll probably smile when you hear me say this, Mark, because I'm sure you've seen the same thing. Patient bring a report to you with a day two progesterone reading <laughs> mm. <laughs> from another doctor. Yeah. Like, how is that a thing? <laughs> like, how is that? When yeah. you're not producing, yeah, why would you, why would you measure yeah. rather than? And, and some, sometimes people are not always aware of their, where they are in their menstrual cycle as well. So. I mean, typically we choose a day 21 just to say about halfway between. Yes, well, how do you well, let's, measure? let's debunk the day 21 because that can also get women into trouble. Mm -hmm. So let's just say again, the luteal phase, the only time in the cycle we make progesterone is the final two weeks. So if someone has a 45 day cycle, for example, which is, yeah, which is normal for a, let's say woman under 20, yep. 22, you know, down in that young age up to 45 days is normal up to 35 days even for an adult woman but let's say let's say a 30 if someone has a 35 day cycle she's ovulating on day 21. so if well, you try to test on day 21 you've uh, missed uh, it you're still in the follicular phase essentially you might get lucky and see the beginning mm -hmm. of progesterone but progesterone goes up you know it starts lower and then it peaks around that mid luteal mm -hmm. and then goes down again and even even during that monthly cycle, there's a, um, a what's the word, uh, not diurnal, but there's, a, there's an hourly, progesterone is cycling on a 90 minute cycle. So it's going up and down all the time. So you do get quite a bit of variation in the actual amount or optimal level, but it should be, if you're a week before your period, it should be, let's agree, like maybe greater than 25 or something like that as an optimal level. And if, you, if a woman has an irregular cycle, she needs to interpret her progesterone rating after she gets her period. So she needs to, does that make sense, right? So she needs to say, okay, I, I did this on yeah. day 28 because I normally have a 35 day cycle. So I should be lit mid luteal if I'm seven days before my period. But then if the period's late, you have to go back and say, was that actually mid luteal? Or did it, you know, was I still in the follicular phase when I did this blood test? And the. Okay. So we yeah, do have a question. Of Just one question on that is can you explain the luteal phase? I mean, in doctors' minds, follicular is day one to 14, luteal no. is day 14 to bleed. And that's not the no. case at all. So, the, what, how do we then define the luteal phase? Is that the last it's 14 days by, of your cycle, by no definition, matter what. the final 14 days of your cycle. And because, because the luteal phase is time limited. Just remember the lifespan of a butterfly. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it, it doesn't have long for this world unless you become pregnant, of course, and then it stretches out for three months. But the follicular phase can go on for weeks and weeks. 
if someone has a very long cycle, the follicular phase, yeah. you're just in kind of the waiting room to ovulation. You're, wait, you're building up to oh. ovulation. That can go on for ages. Once you ovulate, basically, once your temperatures go up, once you ovulate, you, are, you know for certain that you're going to have a bleed two weeks later or be pregnant. There's no other way out of that situation. <laughs> That's what do we just run out of progesterone? Is it like it's got two well, weeks left? The corpus luteum, the corpus luteum survives two weeks unless it's rescued by the fetus, basically. Yeah, the pregnancy, the pregnancy rescues right. it. Okay. And this is important because even just the other day, I was talking to some practitioners who thought who were kind of eyeballing. It's like, oh, well, the luteal phase is the second half of the cycle, no matter how long the cycle is. That is not true. That is not true yes. at all. Yeah. No, cool. it's it's those final 14 days. And keep in mind, and again, this is all in the symposium. We are doing a bit of overlap with my presentation, but that's OK. It'll, that'll be more formalized with slides mm -hmm. and everything. Um, it is also possible to have a cycle where you don't ovulate, which makes okay. it even more interesting. So it's not just when is the luteal phase, but did you have a luteal phase? Because you could go on to bleed. You could have a great long follicular phase and bleed and never ovulate, never have a luteal phase. And that is called an anovulatory okay. cycle. And that I would say that is hormones 101 for anyone watching today. Like, if you're working with women's hormones, you need to know what an anovulatory cycle is and understand why that's happening. Um, what do you do when, when a woman comes and says, oh, some days it's 45 days, some days it's 28, some days I yeah. miss out on a cycle entirely and go 60. Do you use the yep. temperature at that point to determine the, that's the way yes. of figuring? where to look at the luteal phase. so you tra right. have her track temperatures once her temperatures go up you can do the serum progesterone test five or six days later which is redundant at that point really because if the temperatures went up you know she's got progesterone you almost don't have to test it but you could test it just to have that number on paper yeah that okay. that's the, the obviously i'm a huge fan of temperature tracking it's, I refer to it as the original biohacking. You know, if you're gonna measure anything with the body, we have, women have this very cool built-in, you know, temperature shift that says so much about our physiology. So the fact that the first, you know, tracking devices that Apple brought out, they didn't have anything about menstrual cycles or temperature tracking. It's like, they just missed an opportunity there because it's. <laughs> um, well, I've even got a question. What's the best way of measuring temperature? So. Do you go yep. just plain old under, under the, the tongue, tongue. oral yep. standard old? Okay, it, so nothing. No, it's complicated. not complicated. You could do it with an inexpensive temperature. I know in Australia we have in the chemist you can. I usually tell my patients to buy an ovulation thermometer, which just means it's calibrated. It's not calibrated as a fever yeah. thermometer because you're not going to see that kind of temperature rise. It's smaller. You're looking for two decimal points, so you can. And yeah, you have you, you need to look. Uh, that's an important message too. That's an important message because a lot of thermometers, they're absolutely paranoid about missing a fever right. of 40 degrees. And so they're calibrated to really ignore yeah. what's normal and to be very accurate in the yeah. 39 to 42 degree range. And that, that's often the miss that uh, if you just stick one of those under, you get an approximate um, yeah. 0.3 of a degree may be on yeah. their resolution uh, if you're down in the 36. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. So there's yeah. a couple of answers. All right. Um, I've got, is it not possible for luteal phase to be shortened if there's issues like endometriosis or other kinds of uh, health conditions? Is that an It thing? is definitely possible to have a shorter luteal phase for a variety of reasons. Right. A lot of that's going to depend on the quality of the ovarian follicle that made the corpus luteum. Right. And that quality of the ovarian follicle dates back a hundred days right that you you th there's a yeah now that's the fascinating yeah. that's a fascinating story that i never so there was i call it the hundred days to ovulation in my book and the, it's for all of those hundred days as the as the follicles are being recruited they are being you know the the pituitary is sending messages and also it, it's affected by just the environment like how much inflammation is there how much insulin is there all of these things that could impair follicle the, the quality of the follicle including nutritional status is there enough zinc is there enough iodine to get all the way there 
and then you yeah. then the dominant follicle gets recruited then it ovulates and then do you know that it grows from still quite almost you know quite small to a four centimeter structure in the course of like 24 hours it's this crazy there's a um a quote from an australian researcher in my book about there's no other tissue in the body that does this that yes it's flowering. like a flowering that's a nice image and it's so no wonder when you think about all the vitality all the energy that goes into making forming a temporary gland out of nothing that's why a healthy ovulatory menstrual cycle is a reflection of general health right it's why it's our monthly report card because we to be able to do that and to ovulate require you have to tick all the boxes to get there so if you have a short mm -hmm. luteal phase one of those boxes isn't ticked there's something and it could just be under eating right it doesn't have to be complicated but there's something that's okay. not letting you get you know all the way to a robust ovulation and and luteal phase okay oh. there's one one that i would like to address um since progesterone is there right through pregnancy and it is somewhat anti-inflammatory is it immunosuppressive is yes. that the trick that it's immunosuppressive to allow the fetus to exist a kind of parasite in the body and that is that the story about why often joint pains and other things settle down yep. in pregnancy i think that's i think yes i it think is. there's probably i like many topics i think there's more nuance to it but yes in, in a word yes it's somewhat immunosuppressive which is why you've just stated autoimmune conditions can many of them not all of them but many of them can go into remission with pregnancy and yes. converse and I conversely there are a couple of times when autoimmune conditions can flare and those are times when progesterone drops dramatically and those two times would be postpartum and perimenopause mm -hmm. we lose we kind of wave goodbye to progesterone in perimenopause you know we <laughs> sadly i'm through that myself so i can speak from experience it's yeah we it's a wonderful hormone but by our mid 40s our luteal phase is not as robust as in our 30s there's almost nothing you can do about that i mean you can optimize it to as great an extent as possible but progesterone is becoming a thing of the past and that can result in flares of autoimmune disease like Hashimoto's thyroid disease. You typically see that during perimenopause often, maybe postpartum and then again in perimenopause. And you know, the other yeah. thing that um, results from losing progesterone in our 40s, I'm gonna let people chime in. I might just glance at the comments to see if people can guess what that other thing is. Let me just have a look. Losing progesterone in our 40s, no, no. Uh, oh, libido, someone's saying, fair enough. Well, it's uh, heavy periods, right? Heavy flow, right? right? Oh, really? So you know oh, those, okay. well, Why because progesterone has a period lightening effect, right? So progesterone helps to mature oh. the endometrium and prevent it from just this crazy shedding. So I'm sure you've seen, we've all, any clinicians, any of us have seen, perimenopausal women late 40s having flooding periods like crazy yes. periods like if anyone knows so just to give some numbers you know the the average the maximum flow of a normal menstrual flow should be about 80 milliliters over all the days of the cycle so really just a, you know four or five tablespoons over all the days all the four or five days women with flooding periods of perimenopause can be losing like 250 or more milliliters compared to 80 right like it's it can be and that's not everyone in perimenopause it, it's i'd say it's a i think the estimate's about one in four maybe one in three at the women go through this these years of perimenopause when estrogen is actually up to three times higher than it was when we were younger and progesterone's gone <laughs> it's <laughs> Is that is that because the pituitary and the hypothalamus are picking up the loss of sex hormones and yes. FSH, LH keep well, asking, and the progesterone can't respond, whereas the estrogen yep. can respond, being a much lower. It's a lot. Okay. Put it this way, it's a lot easier to make estrogen than progesterone, right? 
Because to make estrogen, all you have to do yeah. is FSH stimulating the ovarian, the growing ovarian follicles, of which there's many of them. To make progesterone, we have to make a corpus luteum, which is that feat that I just described, where you make a four centimeter gland out of yeah. almost nothing. And that is not easy to do. There's so many ob what I call obstacles to ovulation. This is a long list, including insulin resistance, including you know, iodine deficiency. And by the time we get to our 40s, it's just that much harder to ovulate. But exactly as you said, Mark, there is heaps of FSH stimulating the ovarian follicles. And it's been measured. Women, some women can have up to three times more estrogen than they did in their 30s. So that's the unopposed estrogen. That's the ovulatory dysfunction. There's different names, right, for that dysfunctional uterine bleeding in our 40s when you just get crazy heavy periods. And right. that's when women end up going on the hormonal IUD that... or something because, yeah. Okay, so that is fixable. So is that where you use uh, progesterone to top up to try and get that balance right? Is that a possibility for women in their 40s so the corpus luteum it cannot be kind of escalated that quickly? Is that helpful to top up with bioidentical progesterone to bring, say, hot flushes under control, heavy periods under control? Is that therapeutic yes. or not? Let's talk about this. So this, this we're on the topic now of perimenopause, okay. using oral micronized progesterone for perimenopausal symptoms, either of mood, migraines, flooding periods. And I'm going to call on the research of my colleague, Professor Geraldine Pryor, who helped me with my book. She has a whole, she, she's, she runs this, um, at the University of British Columbia in Canada, runs something called the Center for Ovulation Research. And she's published close to 100 papers on progesterone. And she has protocols for, for example, one of the ones I use with my patients quite a lot to share with their doctors is, um, it's managing, she calls it managing menorrhagia, which is heavy periods without surgery, without a hormonal IUD. She uses two to 300 milligrams of oral micronized progesterone. We can put that in the show notes, the, the link to that. Okay. And so that medication, it's a medication, but it's a natural hormone, is called Prometrium in Australia and the US. It's called Eutrogestin these are the brand names in New Zealand and the UK. Of course, you can also get it as compounded progesterone capsules, which is what, what women had to do yeah. for years. Because for so we talked about this a little bit last time, Mark, do you remember for so many years, we did. the only way women could get access to real progesterone, which is so beneficial, was through a compounding chemist through seeking bioidentical hormones. And of course, got scorned for that and ridiculed and the mainstream was like oh bioidentical they're just they're so against it and now here we are finally it's available as a mainstream medication and now they love it like now now it's like well uh, you had to change the name yeah they could never they could never give up the fight so it was not bioidentical yes. it's body identical Identical in, in yeah. every way, but it, it is amazing. Medicine never makes mistakes. When we criticize someone, we just give the answer, steal the answer yeah. and call it something new. And then it's body it's identical. True. There's some well-known critics of complementary medicine that are very, very keen on yes. the change of name. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> I am, I'm just, for me, I just want results for my patients. So I'm rolling with, I'm rolling with the yeah. name change. It's like, say body identical when you're, when you're speaking to your doctor, your conventional GP, especially. We can let the bioidentical go. Although I did speak with a, a clinician over in the States who's still trying to like reclaim the term at bioidentical because it's a perfectly good word. <laughs> mm. I know, I know it's a perfectly good word. The, is there an, a way to naturally in that kind of age 40, is there a way to naturally increase progesterone or are we bound simply to top it up? Is there a way of like bringing the corpus luteum back to life, the, the kind of a ripening of the follicles or is this just how fertility fails that, that we kind of go out slowly not with a, a sudden bang i think there's ways to optimize it managing our expectations like yes i mean we all know there's gonna be women in their 40s right. who are still doing pretty well not having those heavy periods obviously are still certainly i've talked to women who kept having pretty regular ovulatory cycles tracking their temperatures into their late 40s so it's possible 
I think you just, like I said, you have to tick all the boxes. So you have to not be insulin resistant. You have to have an optimally functioning thyroid. You know, you have to not have too much stress. You have to be fully nourished. You have yeah. to not be taking any medications that could interfere with it all down the list. And some of that is, some of that is, and some yeah. of it's just luck too, genetically. I think, well, not think, I know some of us just have longer lasting fertility than others. There's just a normal range of about, mm. you know, 10 years. And this is one of the things, cause I've just written, I'm hoping it'll come out next year, a book on menopause and perimenopause. And one of the things I want to really emphasize is that genetic aspect. So uh, certainly I've known many women who are very fit and healthy, but still go yeah. through menopause in their mid to late forties. That's just normal for them. So, so a lot of it's a genetic blueprint when it comes to our ovaries deciding to, yeah. There seems, it seems to be a sensible question. When did yes. your mother enter menopause? Often is for a sure. good predictor of what, what happens for the next generation. Sure. So, um, does repeated pregnancies have an effect on that? So if you're not ovulating for, you know, five kids, the old days of five to 10 kids, you know, yeah. the kids were everywhere. If there's less ovulations, are you doing anything to preserve more or is, is time just Well, this is an interesting question because what you're referring to there in part, I think, is this idea that, well, if we run out of eggs, you know, does not ovulating as much does saving eggs somehow delay menopause, which would seem a logical extension of that idea that we run out of eggs. But the problem, it just does not seem to be the case because, well, for one thing, for one thing, being on the pill also stops ovulation for decades. Sure, and actually what true. the research shows is being on the pill brings menopause earlier, if anything, because it causes a very shrinkage. And, and I think, for me, part of it, I think, comes down to, I think there's a lot more to that story that we run out of eggs. I don't think we run out of eggs. This is controversial. The research has been going back and forth, back and forth, but there's some evidence now, it's been there for a while, that we actually have what are called ovarian stem cells, that we don't run out of eggs. We do stop ovulating at some point, which is genetically programmed. I would say there's an adaptive reason to do that. Mm -hmm. But in answer to your question, not I don't think not ovulating conserves eggs, but all that said, pregnancies themselves have different effects on health. So it, it's possible pregnancy alters the timing of menopause through some other mechanism. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. All right. There, there was a time, I mean, we've got the experiment that um, youthful, when you could not prevent pregnancy, youthful pregnancies, repeated pregnancies were the absolute norm. And then suddenly the pill comes along and we think of it as the pill just preventing pregnancy, but there is so much happened. My, you know, my, the previous generation of mine started on the pill and it was saving pregnancies, but it, for the first time gave women choice about of when course, to become yeah. pregnant. And then that moved it from early in life to later in life. And I always wondered if there was some profound effect of that, that if you just shift the ovulatory cycles where they choose seem to choose all the good eggs early if you believe some of the literature is that a case or is it really just rubbish that you know you you have preserving your health and you've got the capacity for the perfectly good pregnancies all the way through life until you stop yeah i don't think anything to, i don't think there's anything to the concept that you preserve eggs or anything like that as to whether you know the egg quality right. in our late 30s and 40s is not as good as the egg quality in our 20s but that's the same for sperm right sperm quality isn't as good in yeah. later years that's going to be a genetic quality issue yeah I, but i mean honestly the fact that we our life history is quite different now women don't have a, a number of pregnancies when they're young that is going to have effects on health big term but long term but i don't think we quite understand what all of those are yet all right look Laura, I think what we're going to do is there are just good. so many <laughs> questions. Um, I know, I know, it's good. We've uh, we've reached uh, forty, and only about four of them are answered. Would you mind if just I just went through a few? Go of these through ones? some questions, and if I think of something else burning that I really need to say, I'll just pop in okay. with that. Yeah. There are okay. There are a few of them that are asking the relationship between the thyroid, and especially something that's yeah. becoming a much bigger issue, mainly for women yes. of Hashimoto's of the autoimmune thyroiditis. And it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem. Does managing the thyroid, the, the sense of the question is, 
managing the thyroid's essential for temperature as well. So A, you can get mistakes that if the thyroid's underactive, you're getting low temperatures. Does that also mean low progesterone? And does fixing the thyroid or focusing on the thyroid automatically help fertility, progesterone? Does it, does it work the other way that if you get the thyroid right, the hormones come back to life when they may not. Exactly. Have yes. What you just said. So if, well, if there's an underlying problem with thyroid, that is one of the boxes that needs to be ticked to achieve good ovarian follicle quality, good ovulation, good levels of progesterone. So I have, I've in the past, I've done for social media, a little image of progesterone and thyroid and a two way bi-directional. There is a bi-directional relationship in that Healthy okay. thyroid is essential for healthy ovulation and therefore progesterone. And conversely, progest well, it's a couple things, but progesterone itself directly stimulates thyroid. So it does boost T4 levels, which is interesting. Sorry. But also probably more importantly is in the territory of autoimmune thyroid disease, having anovulatory cycles or being in a you know, postpartum or a time of low progesterone potentially increases the risk of autoimmune thyroid disease. So, and, and also with my perimenopausal patient groups, I would have observed that taking progesterone can help with thyroid antibodies and help to stabilize autoimmune conditions, including thyroid. So, and in, in terms of the temperatures, yes. So both, what, ideally what you want is a baseline healthy thyroid, then that's your baseline temperature. And then you still get the, the luteal phase right. on, the on top of that. Place. Yeah. But if you have an undirected thyroid, typically what happens with the cycles, anyone who in the audience, I'm sure there are many people who do fertility awareness method or fertility tracking and use really deep dive looking at the temperatures. What you see with underactive thyroid is the luteal phase doesn't hold. You get this rise and then you get these like kind of these drops in the luteal phase, which is usually a giveaway that something's going on with the thyroid. Plus you'll see it overall the baseline follicular phase is lower. Yep. Okay. Does that impair fertility? So hypothyroidism is typically associated with relative yeah. infertility, but we think of that as just a kind of metabolic issue, but it can be directly in the progesterone not being yeah. sustained over the, the health of, it's also the health of the ovarian follicle, probably. And the, and the, yeah, the okay. sustainability of the corpus luteum, the whole, the whole picture. Plus, you know, the thyroid antibodies, the okay. autoimmunity is, not ideal for fertility either. Yep. I know. And we have our, you know, our gluten relationships with thyroiditis and polycystic ovarian. There's, there's a lot of fiddling between the gut, yep. food, diet, autoimmunity, and how our hormones yep, function. Sure. And we're, while, we're, while we're dealing with one big one today, uh, I have a sense that if we look at every hormone, we would see the same fiddling going on. That when you've got, neuro, uh, you've got autoimmune endocrine disorders, the whole hypothalamus is it trying to organize how, where's my progesterone, where's yeah. my thyroid hormone, and sending messages which are not stable and able to maintain stability. For in sure. hormones. I've got a, gr a group of questions about, can you just manage people who present with heavy periods at whatever age, is that A, likely to be progesterone related? So if there's been a change, they've had a, a normal cycle and it becomes worse as they're in their say thirties. Is it progesterone related? And can you stop heavy periods by just simply supplementing progesterone in the second half of the cycle? Okay. The short answer is yes. Progesterone always has a period lightening effect. So if it's an appropriate treatment, that is, right. that's an option, but it's not the whole story. So of course my approach, and I know yours would be as an integrative doctor is to try to go back to the underlying cause, right, of heavy periods, yeah. which sometimes is anovulation or not making enough progesterone or not making any progesterone. Sometimes that's the main cause, in which case the solution is, could be to get progesterone, but also to correct the reason for the anovulation. In the case of a teenager, that's just because she's young and needs to, you know, ha have a few years to develop her menstrual cycle and you can support her in the meantime with some other period lightening strategies which I use which I can I'll talk about in a minute but the other thing with heavy periods of course you also especially with well any woman really but especially into the 30s and 40s you need to identify what else is going on like is there adenomyosis which is 
as you know, quite common, quite a, a major cause of heavy periods and requires treatment beyond just progesterone, I would say. It's, it's an inflammatory disease. Oh. Is there a fibroid that's causing the heavy periods? And, yeah. and there could be fibroids present, but they're not the cause of the heavy periods. But if the fibroid is the cause of the heavy period, then that needs to be understood. Also, I'm curious about if you've sort of worked much with this, but my understanding from the research is that about, about one in five women who are having heavy, floody peri heavy flooding periods have, um, is it Von Wildenbrand, have coagulation disorder, a genetic coagulation disorder. Oh, right. And sometimes the heavy periods can be the only sign of that. So they, well, they might have heavy, oh, heavy periods all their life, easy bruising, maybe hemorrhage after delivery, those sorts okay. of things for the mild, some of the milder coagulation disorders. Right. And that. Okay. So that, I mean, that suggests that if you work through all the other obvious or other yeah. not so obvious causes of bleeding, if the fibroids and the adenomyosis, yeah. if you if you don't have clotting and coagulation, that it's more or less progesterone's at the yes. end of that line. That as long as you've excluded pathology, and made sure that yeah. there's nothing serious that needs to be addressed, then the progesterone trial is a reasonable thing to do. To modify progesterone that. always lightens periods, and this is this okay. goes back to Professor Pryor's managing menorrhagia without surgery. I would argue even even without the hormonal IUD. So let's talk about the hormonal IUD for a minute because I'm not against it. As you know, it can be, for women with very heavy periods, it can be a lifesaver, especially if it means she doesn't have to have a hysterectomy, then I would say a hormonal IUD is preferable to a hysterectomy. So that's the drug, there's no progesterone in that, even though they call it a progesterone IUD, right? It's, that's levongestrel, okay. that's a progestin. And it does lighten periods quite dramatically, but it potentially can have side effects because progestins affect mood, for example. So that's where coming, trying some progesterone instead, at least trying it can be helpful in combination with, I really do need to mention a couple of other things for heavy periods for anybody who's out there and that's one of their main concerns or they have patients who that's, that's their main concern. There is a role of mast cells and histamine in heavy periods. And that is because the uterine lining is full of mast cells. And in addition to releasing histamine, they release heparin, which is a, a blood thinner, as you know. So, they, so right. a lot of, as a naturopath, my approach with heavy periods is also to address that kind of inflammatory mast cell side of things. And once again, that comes back in my clinical practice to trying some months without cow's dairy. It's not a perfect fix mm -hmm. for every single person, but I think if someone's dealing with heavy periods, they need to at least try some months without cow's dairy and they might find that it lightens periods quite a lot. And that is particularly true for teenage girls, young teens, because I don't want to give a progesterone, who wants to give a progesterone capsule to a 13 year old girl, right? Like that's, right. that's just not yeah. what we're doing. It's certainly not what I would want to do. And they can receive, yeah, they can, if you take dairy out, give iron because they're probably iron deficient if, or if they need it. And also being iron deficient makes periods heavier yeah. because so it become, become a vicious cycle. And also make sure she's fully nourished, especially with zinc. And you will find those girls, you know, the period lightens pretty quickly and then hopefully she starts to ovulate and then makes her progesterone and then, you know, she grows out of, that's the that's the critical thing that I got yep. from your writing is getting to the ovulatory cycle yes. has a natural cycle forming yep. effect. So it's chicken and egg, you know, how do you get to that point? And you're saying diet can bring you back to the point where the normal ovulatory cycle repairs the very thing that you thought you were trying to fix, which was exactly. menorrhagia. And so you can do it with diet indirectly as a, a long term sustainable. Ex exactly. So the, put it this way, the body well, if you're under 45, you know, under 50, the, your body wants right. to ovulate. It's, it's going to do that. Right. It wants to do that. And so it's really about, as I said earlier, identifying what are the obstacles to the body doing that and removing those obstacles so it can get there. Yeah. Great. That's yeah. great advice. There's two things that I want to do. We've got okay. a couple of minutes. One of them is there's a, a lot of questions about why are you measuring serum progesterone? Why not the kind of the salivary or the urinary test or why not tests of 
the metabolites of it and go uh, so there is a duct yeah. test and other types of tests around that do this why would you choose serum rather than uh the okay. urinary for example well for me for a lot of testing i'm sure you can agree anytime you choose a test the question is what am i asking with this test what am i trying what am I to for? understand with this test yeah. so certainly there are questions that could be asked you know need, where you might need to look at the metabolites questions around that but if the question is is my patient ovulating and making progesterone in her does she have a luteal phase a serum a, a serum a reading answer, answers that question and for me it's yeah. i'm a really okay. i'm a very like for the people kind of clinician like it's it's also the cost of it actually for me it's it's just it's yeah. inexpensive and That's simple um and simpler in a way it answers what i'm trying to answer if i was yeah. going to order more testing and more complicated testing with my patients it's always going upstream from ovulation yeah. to what's to try to identify what's inhibiting it including insulin resistance i can't i can't emphasize that enough we're going to talk about that on yeah. next sunday in my presentation, I'm going to show a glucose tolerance test with insulin. We're going to look at a case study about PCOS and insulin resistance. But for a lot of women, insulin resistance is the, ma the major obstacle to ovulation. So if you don't identify that with your patient, you've missed an opportunity to actually correct the problem with progesterone, if that makes sense. I'm connecting the dots between insulin no. through, via the ovarian follicle. No. To progesterone. Progesterone is the reward. It's the ultimate downstream hormone. <laughs> All right. And so in that reward, the final question is going to be, what do we do about menopause? There's good and bad press, estrogen and progesterone. There's a, a so much confusing information out there. Is it safe to simply provide progesterone unopposed? Do you try and match the body's response or do you let women enter menopause and then work at diet or other things how i, mean, I know question question, okay how do we manage menopause i'm going to answer and then i'm going to let you chime in because i'm sure you've you know you've prescribed hormones and have worked in this field as well but <laughs> i'm i'm old enough to have been through menopause but i have okay to the all right to have it so i'm not an okay. expert there i'm just thinking in which order to say things it is safe to use progesterone alone in fact, Professor Pryor, we saw her face pop up earlier, and her, she's got a couple of clinical trials using progesterone alone for symptoms of both perimenopause and menopause. So it's safe. Okay. Now, that is not to say that estrogen cannot be used. So progesterone is safer than estrogen. Progesterone is safer for breasts. There's that. In fact, Professor Pryor argues that progesterone helps to reduce the risk of breast cancer, which is quite interesting and important. But some women with menopause, especially early menopause, do require, also require estradiol, preferably transdermal. If you're gonna take estrogen, let me say you really wanna take it through a patch or a cream or topical, it's a lot safer that way in terms yeah. of clotting risk. And if you are going to take estrogen, you should take it with oral micronized progesterone as your progestin, and that's true even if you don't have a uterus. Would you agree with that, Mark? Yeah, because, okay. yeah, what do you think? What are you protecting the, there? So it's breasts, for the neurolo neurological breasts, effects? Breasts. Breasts course, and brain and mood. So I know the narrative, the prevailing narrative is that we only need progestins for the uterus, but that is just not the case. That all dates back to the kind of historical, this is the, this is the crux of the problem, actually. Progestins were only ever seen as a, well, as a, well, they're part of hormonal birth control, but also as a way to protect the uterus. They were an afterthought, right? With no one looked at progesterone for its own merits and how beneficial that could be for all the different systems, except for Professor Pryor and right. obviously, you know, various clinicians. But pro progesterone can be used for perimenopause and menopause. And then what I say with my patients is try progesterone first. If you need, well, try magnesium first. Try all the other lifestyle things first. If you need something, try progesterone. If you still need something, bring in a transdermal estrogen. Is valid. Is is a much safer yeah. than the old, as you know, much safer than the old style oral Premarin estrogens. Those were that old style HRT from the 80s, 90s. I started practicing in the mid 90s. 
those were horrid medications. I mean, now those days are gone. Um, so, okay. And uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I see it. Actually just popped, it popped. It popped up. There was something else I was gonna. Oh, Thank I was gonna you. say about progesterone for perimenopause, very specifically for migraines, because as you know, it has an anti-migraine effect because of its calming effect on the nervous system. And migraines, yeah. re recurrence of migraines, or like an increase in the frequency of migraines, is a classic symptom of perimenopause, and it's from losing progesterone. Yeah. Okay. All right. So is this migraines that people had early on in life or is these well, brand new migraines? Is it just simply? Usually flexible? here's a pattern, which I've seen with my patients. Someone might've had migraines when they were a teenager, like what puberty, you know, first started getting migraines, then they kind of grew out of them. Then they got migraines when they tried the pill <laughs> and then they stopped them. Right. And then their migraines start up again in their forties or become more frequent in their forties. And progesterone is quite good for that in combination with magnesium yeah okay any other any other thoughts beyond milk in the diet have you found any other things that are i mean i mean all of us hate gluten to a, a greater or lesser extent because of the groups of people who are not celiac but uh, gluten and non-celiac gluten intolerance is gluten it tends to be a pro-inflammatory part of the diet is it important in this area or is this more thyroiditis that the gluten reactivity is associated with? Well, as you know, gluten can affect every system. It absolutely yeah. can affect progesterone. So the way I come at it, there's a certain portion of the population who have the genetic, the genotype, the haplotype who reacts to gluten. Yep. A yeah, it's a proportion. I mean, it is, it is around yeah. 15 to 20 percent, so no. it's not trivial. And only only ten percent of them ever get celiac disease, which is the only thing that doctors ever think of yep. related to that. But that's no, not true. So is I've it? actually started doing just ordering that genotype for my patients. I think it's really quite helpful to know if you yeah. have that celiac autoimmune gluten genotype. And if you yeah. if you do, that is going to affect everything, including ovulatory cycles and progesterone. So the the very first patient story in Period of Pair Manual, my book is, I think right, her name, I called her Megan in that story. She, her, her, she had um, irregular cycles coming, you know, every two to three month long cycles. And her doctor said, I'll just take the pill, of course, which is not a solution for irregular cycles. But we discovered that she was sensitive to gluten, not celiac, but gluten sensitive. And as soon as she removed, not as soon, but four or five months after she removed gluten, she got a regular cycle and her progesterone would have gone up. Just having a more regular cycle means more progesterone because you're ovulating more frequently and her, her levels you know, went up as well. So that's an example. The other place where gluten and the the celiac genotype plays a role is in endometriosis and adenomyosis. So there's, this is a little bit off topic, but it's really worth mentioning because I won't be speaking about endometriosis next weekend. Unfortunately, you'll have to have me back for a whole talk about endometriosis, but the, don't worry, there's a Q oh, okay, well, we can talk about in the, the Q end. Anyone we can talk about in the Q, up, in the Q and So there that. was a, a, a quite fascinating, um, reproductive his qualification was a reproductive immunologist jeffrey braverman who unfortunately has passed away now but he he was doing this fascinating work with his infertility patients where he was testing everyone for celiac genotype or the haplotype the hla haplotype and he yes. found amongst his patient population that 95 percent of endometriosis sufferers have that so I would say right. it, this is my approach to endo. It's, you know, it's an immune, a disease of immune dysfunction. I'd say adeno, it's probably in that same category. So when there's that type of thing happening, or as you say, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, then you really need to bring gluten front and center as something to think about and probably eliminate quite strictly. Yep. Okay. So uh, the answer, the answer seems to be that you would take people off milk as the primary thing, all milk products, dairy yeah, but, and milk oh, products. Oh, yeah, keep going. And the, yeah. yeah, and secondarily, you still look for other foods that may be pro-inflammatory. Uh, is it inflammation control you're after or is it specific foods? How, why is it that milk is- Yeah, it's A1 dairy. So it's 
It's, it's A1 casein uh -huh. stimulates okay. mast cells in certain people. Right. So the um, that A2 dairy would include goat and sheep products and A2 milk as well. It doesn't seem to have that same effect. So in terms of just a general, because of the mast cells and the mast cells in the uterine lining, that's... I would do a general kind of try no cow's dairy for a while for anyone. And that doesn't have to be strict. If it's not someone with an autoimmune tendency, I'm like, just dial down the cow's dairy. And from the histamine mast cell perspective, that seems to be enough. I put people who have that celiac genotype, I put them in their own category. They're like in their own room, unfortunately. That, you know, that's a, that's a different right. situation. <laughs> I sometimes use thyroid antibodies as kind of a surrogate marker for that or a, hist a family history of autoimmune thyroid disease. If you've got those autoimmune genes, yeah. you're now in a different room. Yeah. We go into that room and now we have to have a conversation about strictly avoiding some of the antigens possibly casein gluten would be right up there sometimes eggs you know and it's and unfortunately once you're in that autoimmune territory you can't just probably just dial down things you really have to make a decision to try to avoid them strictly for a while would you agree yeah, yeah. I do I do agree I think this is another one of those areas where if you can get the gut right and the foods and the and the non histamine release on the gut make sure gut pore permeability is right you do so much to settle down a hyper responsive sure. immune system that it's in that surveillance area and if the gut is forever switching it upwards then you have to drop it down the funny thing i thought was some people would prefer all of the all the worst bits of um premenstrual syndrome of heavy bleeding or anything else and still have their bread i'm amazed that gluten almost seems to be addictive. I'm, I'd be surprised if it wasn't, that people will sacrifice anything to get their bread and their pizza, even when they're well. When well, they you know out. about the, the opiates, the um, casomorphin and gluten. Like, so do. literally for some people, yes, casein and gluten are quite literally addictive. Not for everyone, but yes, for the unfortunate people right. who, and those are the people who most need to avoid them. They form an addiction to them. It's, it's not easy. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm a, I am amazed that people come and say, help me with my arthritis, uh, women yeah. with thyroiditis. And when you say, okay, you're going to have to come off gluten and there's a, you know, the thyroiditis is not that Aww. bad. I, like, I can get by with that. But when they do, when they come off it and they get the, uh, the benefits, I am surprised to this day that if the gut is right and the diet is right and you put that effort in, about a half of the downstream specialties of medicine are yeah. irrelevant. Uh, you know, the rheumatologists and yeah. some of the immunologists. We've ignored the gut for so long, and now we're suddenly discovering it again. And that the basic parts of diet, exercise, yeah. gut. I'm sure we're going to hear more about these from you. And I, I want to yeah. thank you for today, but this is a yeah. teaser for anyone. You, they're going to be back in, I think it's, it's the, the 14th. 14th it's the 14th right? in Australia. So I guess that would be the 13th in other parts of the world. Because <laughs> we, live, we live in the future. <laughs> I uh, we do live in the future, but you yeah, ahead yeah. of us and that's irritating. <laughs> so I want to thank you for that. Yeah. It's been great to cover all these areas. It's it's a teaser for what's yet to come, but it does help us cover progesterone and there's different focuses for your for your presentations on the fourteenth, but everyone should be back. I think everyone will be back there listening a second time. So thank you, Lara yeah. Bryden. It's thank been you fantastic. everyone. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. This is Mark Donahue with Laura Bryden for FX Medicine, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Um, we start the Bioceuticals uh, Symposium 2020. Whole different way of doing it, and I'll see you all online tomorrow. Bye. <laughs>